In June of 2019, Bethesda released Vault 51, which was the central location in their Nuclear Winter Battle Royale gameplay mode. While we could explore the vault while waiting for a Nuclear Winter match to start, it was a timed lobby so we couldn't take our time, and a lot of the lore content was locked to us depending upon how far we had advanced in Nuclear Winter. It took a lot of grinding Nuclear Winter matches to increase our Overseer rank high enough to be able to unlock all of that lore content, and so a very kind YouTuber named Dancing Tango gave me access to his account, and using a character of his who had already unlocked all of that content, I was able to produce a lore video exploring and understanding the entire story of Vault 51, and I published that video in July of 2019. Nuclear Winter went on for a while until Bethesda decided to scrap that gameplay mode in September of 2021. During that time, Vault 51 was inaccessible for a while until it came back as a standalone location in Appalachia that we can finally fully explore. It's time to revisit Vault 51 to see what's the same and what's changed. Upon arriving at Vault 51, we find the giant door shut. Heading up to it, we can't access it, and we don't find any platform or button out here that we can use to open it. I ran around on top, looking for a hole or some other way inside, and it was then that I noticed a wire leading from the door all the way to the back of a large truck. Moving inside the truck, we pass by some Vault Tech containers, until we find two corpses. Both of them are vault dwellers, one in scout armor, the other in marine armor. And on the wall directly above them is a big red button. We hear the door start to open. Racing out, we can watch it slide to the side. We are greeted by the dark emptiness and when ready, we can walk up the ramp to enter Vault 51. We arrive at the vault entrance, and at first glance it appears to have not changed too much from the way it looked in the previous incarnation of the vault. We find Vault 51 jumpsuits lying about, sadly we can't interact with them, and on the walls we find a poster, Vault Tech Procedures. Vault Tech provides all clothing, bedding, and accommodations for residents. Personal belongings must be reviewed and approved of by an authorized vault Tech Hermetics technician before such belongings can be delivered to your reserved quarters within the vault. All vault residents must attend an orientation seminar. If you did not attend such a seminar as part of the application process, you must make an appointment with your vault Tech representative. Turning around, we find the vault entrance terminal lying on a desk, and next to this is a holotape, Reuben Gill to whoever finds this vault. My name is Reuben Gill. Uh, I was one of the 50 people living in Vault 51. Upon listening to it, we realize that the content is exactly the same as it was during Nuclear Winter. Looks like the holotapes haven't changed. However, halfway through listening to the holotape, we do hear a new voice. The ease with which candidates utilize nuclear weapons is Quite interesting. Can't ever. Whoa. That wasn't on the holotape. That was in the vault. Does that mean Zax is still around? Is he in here watching me? Now, since I've already covered the contents of this holotape and all other holotapes, I won't repeat them again here. These tell the story of what happened here in Vault 51, and if interested, I organized them in a way that makes sense to tell the story in my previous video on Vault 51 that you can watch here. Instead, we can check the terminal, and we see that the terminal has the Rachel Shields entry on June 3rd, 2078. This is another terminal entry that was already found here in the vault. And so, like with the holotapes, I won't be going over all of the terminal entries again. Instead, for this video, we're going to focus on how the layout of the vault has changed and see if we can find anything new. Backing out of the terminal, we see a vault girl statue in the corner and one door out. 
Moving east, we can pass through a door through screening. Here we find a red button on the wall that activates the rad scrubbers. We can get rid of our rads this way and then open a door to arrive at a lobby. We see a banner over a doorway leading to reception that says, Welcome to Vault 51. But before heading that way, we can turn around to open a door to the clinic. The clinic is pretty small, but we do find some new stuff here. On one of the beds, we find blood spatter and chunks of flesh. Turning around, we find another hollow tape on a push cart. This one is Helen Marks and Reuben Gill, August 3rd, 2078. And while listening to this one, Zax again interrupts us. Your heart rate is increasing. Good. It means you are aware of your situation. Oh, great. He's monitoring my heart rate? It's not creepy. Turning right, we find a couple of other beds with bodies on them. And in the far corner, we find another terminal, this one with regarding Nancy's death on it. To leave the clinic, we find two doors, a staircase leading up to the south or a sliding door to the east. Opening the sliding door, we arrive at the nursery. We see a body draped over a balcony above us. Oh, but then we find enemies. Scorched. Well, what are the Scorched doing here? Could they have found their way into this vault and tried to take it over? On a crate next to a pile of soccer balls, we find the holotape Joel and Elizabeth Chambers, June 23rd, 2078. Looking around, we see blood spatter on some rock to the east, but jumping up with our jetpack, we don't find any body or any idea how this blood spatter got here. We knocked off the body that was draped over the balcony during the fight. She just has a stim pack on her inventory. There are a couple of doors in here, but back into the clinic, we can scale up the staircase to arrive on the balcony overlooking the garden. But here we don't find much. Moving southeast, however, we do find a door that leads to the living quarters. And here we find more scorched. We are in a common room and attached to this room are a number of private bedrooms. We find a skill level two locked door against the wall to the east. Opening it, we find a ghoul. I guess this must have been a vault dweller. The door has been locked and this guy was spared from being infected by the scorched plague. Instead, he got radiation poisoning. There's not much by the bed except for on the bedside table. Here we find the Vault 51 executive key card. We'll take that and figure out where it goes later. Turning south, we find a skill level three locked wall safe on the wall with a bunch of goodies inside. And then lying atop the vanity is Reuben Gill, October 23rd, 2102. And while listening to this holotape, Zach interrupts us again. It seems the new settlers of Appalachia are ideal candidates. They rarely hesitate to kill. When done, we can move back to the common room and open the door to the south. This leads to a bathroom. We find pink slippers on the ground, and next to the toilet, the holotape, Harold Clark to the members of the board, part two. Back out to the common room, we can head to the other southern door, which is already opened and leads to another bedroom. But here we find signs of a struggle. In the southeastern corner are skeletonized remains. A vault dweller was crushed by this falling bookcase. There is a book on the ground between his legs. And then we see one of the corners of the bookshelf snapped off and it's surrounded by blood. We get the impression that this bookcase was sabotaged. Someone wanted to kill this guy. They weakened the bookshelf so that when this guy came to retrieve a book, the movement caused the bookshelf to fall over and crush him to death. Heading back out to the common room, we can open a big vault door, which leads to the atrium. And here we find... <laughs> more scorched. All right, we'll explore the atrium in a minute. I want to make sure we explore everything to the sides first. So retracing our steps back into the garden and down the staircase to the clinic, we can make our way back to the lobby and arrive at reception. From reception, we find a door to the garden slash nursery that we just explored. And behind the reception desk lying on the ground is another dead vault dweller clutching a 10 millimeter pistol. 
The monitor behind her is spattered with blood. She was shot as she sat here in this chair. We can read the front desk terminal. This has a list of every member of the vault, and this hasn't changed. Like the last time we saw this, everyone is marked deceased except for Reuben Gill, whose status is unknown. From here, we could move south into the atrium, but turning west, we find a door leading to security. Opening the door, we arrive at security to find a number of desks and boxes and doors. One of the terminals on one of these desks has these campaigns must stop. And then on another desk, we find a Reuben Gill, May 20th, 2084. On this desk is another terminal with Stephen Burnett, February 27th, 2078. You'll notice that we collect all of these holotapes and terminal entries out of chronological order. I did my best to put them in proper order and tell the story as it happened in my previous lore video on Vault 51. Now, turning around, we see that the office goes off to the south, but there is a door here to the west. It's locked with a skill level one lock, but picking it, we arrive in a supply room. Lots of crates lying about, but they're mostly empty. Turning a corner, we find some crates next to some traffic cones, and on the ground next to the cone is the holotape Sergeant Baker, July 27th, 2078. This smaller supply room leads to a much larger warehouse. Here we find shelves covered in containers, a dead vault dweller lying on the ground, and a ghoul. Moving forward, we find another. There's not much on these shelves. We do find a combat rifle and some ammo. And at the back, we find a bunch of Christmas decorations with presents. Candidate, if you remain here, you will be safe from fire. You are likely to be shot soon. Well, I guess I'm glad to know that these trees and Christmas presents aren't flammable. At least vault Tech thought of that. Let's see if we can explore this place without dying to scorched. I leapt atop the shelves to see if I could find anything else, but there's nothing else here, so this is a dead end. Retracing our steps, we can arrive back at Vault Security and finish exploring this room to the south. Here we find another body lying in the southeastern corner. He's surrounded by empty beer bottles and sitting next to a ham radio. Maybe he drank himself to death or died to radiation while he was trying to call for help. We find another terminal on a desk. This one has the I need your help entry. And the last terminal has the Brianna Ware entry from May 1st, 2078. To exit security, we can go through a door in the southern wall towards the showers. Here we find a couple of showers and a big locker room. We see many doors on either wall. The door against the western wall has an ID card reader. Well, we just picked up an ID card. Does this open? Yes, it does. So the executive ID card we found in the skill level two locked room opens this door in the showers. This is probably important. We'll come back to explore it later. I wanted to examine these lockers first, but we don't find much. Though we do find two more doors against the southern wall. One leads to the atrium. We'll explore that in a bit. The other leads to the gym. Heading inside the gym, we see a bunch of exercise equipment and... <gasps> oh, a boxing match. Oh, this thing gets scorched. Well, after surviving the boxing match, we can head in to explore. We see a TV on the wall. It appears to have been playing a boxing match. We still hear the audio coming out of it. Moving to the eastern side, we find a body in the southwestern corner, and his head has been smashed in by barbells. Oh, man, these vault dwellers were vicious. Now, there were some doors to the east, but we also find one by the boxing ring to the south. This leads to a small corridor with a door to the south and another to the west. The western door has an ID card reader and the executive key card we found opens it. Looks like this one might connect to the other one. We'll find out for sure when we come back later. Continuing south, we arrive in another corridor with more doors everywhere and another ID card reader to the right. And our executive card can open this one as well. Okay, making mental note. Turning around, we can open this door and it leads to a stage. 
and there is a scorched on the stage. I think I want to go around behind, moving south. We find a back room behind the stage. Here a vault dweller's head has been crushed by a blue crate. Oh, nasty. We find instruments on the ground and on shelves, and then heading through a southern door, we can round a corner to follow a pathway leading behind the stage. And here we find another scorched on the ground. Oh, I hear him. Where is he? There's one more. And with that, the stage is clear. It is said that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Thanks, Zax. Try to remember that. Moving behind the curtain, we can explore what's back here. We see a corpse. Data suggests it is customary to knock before entering someone's home. Welcome, candidate. Well, geez, look who's a chatty Kathy. Just can't keep your mouth shut. You sounded pissed off. I think we offended him. We offended the artificial intelligence computer, which apparently now has feelings. Great. The corpse is lying on a plywood cut out of a cowboy. She wields a police baton in her hand, and on a crate next to her body is the holotape Harold Clark to the members of the board Part 1. We don't find much else on stage. Moving to the audience, we don't see anything there, though we do see another level above us, but no staircase leading up. On a chalkboard nearby, we can find the vault's agenda for the day. There was a talent show at 11.30, a play at 3 p.m., an assembly at 7.30, and a musical at 8.15 that they apparently canceled. Hmm, I guess they were all too busy. The only other door we haven't explored yet is this northern one by a Nuka-Cola machine. And this leads back out to the atrium. The door to the left goes back to the gym. Okay, we are making progress here, but still no way up to that upper platform. I could use my jetpack, but I want to find the staircase that leads there. Well, we should probably tackle this atrium now. Heading to the middle of the atrium, we see the overseer's office towering above us. There is a body in the middle of the atrium with caps on the ground next to it and a 44 caliber revolver. Let's see, um, well, let's move south. Here we find another door with an ID card reader. Can we open it? No. Looks like we need to find another ID card. Then moving east, we can go through a big double door to enter the cafeteria. Here we find a porter diner. We can try our luck. No dice. Against the southern wall is a door that leads to... A Wendigo! Oh, God! Stinking Wendigo! How do you get here? Did the Vault Dwellers resort to cannibalism? Exploring the game room, we find a chalkboard with betting odds on it. Death Pool, June, $140. Cassidy, $120. Where were they gambling for life here? Yikes! Now opening a door to the west, we arrive at a library. There's another corpse on the ground. He was holding a sledgehammer. Moving to one of the terminals, we can try to read it. Oh, wait! Oh, devious! Someone rigged the terminals to explode! There's a tripwire right here that we completely missed, and the explosion knocked this Vault Dweller corpse over the table. Rewinding a bit, we can see exactly what happened. There was a cigar box bomb on the underside of this table that detonated when we tripped the tripwire. Well, thankfully, the terminals still work. The one we tried to read had the inventory anomaly entry on it. The one to the right of this 
had the Rosemary Villa March 5th, 2078 entry on it. Then turning around, this one has the Eleanor Montgomery May 20th, 2078 entry on it. There's an ammo canister beneath the second one. The next terminal has requisition request redacted, Zach's console log October 23rd, 2080, and regarding Hellfire prototype requisition request explaining why Hellfire Power Armor was sent to this vault. The final terminal has all of Angela Callahan's entries. She's the character who ended up eventually worshipping Zax as a god. This room leads back out to the atrium, but heading back into the game room, we can further examine it. There are a lot of Vault Dweller corpses lying about, one by the pool table, one by the gambling table in the middle of the room, one lying on top of the piano. And then over by the bar, we find the Elizabeth Chambers holotape from October 19th, 2077. Opening the northern door after killing the Wendigo. Well, that was a mess, but a well-executed mess. Very good. Seems we've impressed Zax. We arrive in a lounge, lots of beautiful chairs and tables, paintings on the wall, but nothing else of interest. The lounge leads back to the cafeteria, which we still need to fully explore, but heading back into the lounge, we can go through a northern door to start moving towards what appears to be a kitchen. This sink room also leads back out to the cafeteria, and we see that the vault dwellers tried to barricade themselves in the cafeteria. The tables have been overturned, and we find bullet holes in them. There is one vault dweller corpse behind this barricade, which clearly didn't work. And against the northern wall of the cafeteria is a door that leads back out to the garden slash nursery. All right, well, I think we've done a full loop here. Heading back towards the kitchen, we can fully explore it. We see that smoke permeates the air here. There is a vault dweller corpse lying on the counter. And then... Ah. Ugh, I hope that's the last of them. Behind the counter, we find three big containers, one of vegetables, one of stock, and one of meat. Nummy. Turning around, we can examine the nook that the scorched came from. Some minor boxed foods, that's about it. And that's really all there is in the kitchen. And so we can head back out to the atrium. We find a vault dweller here, clutching a monkey wrench. We see the soccer balls that we enjoyed so much during nuclear winter still rolling around here on the atrium floor. Let's see if we can find any doors that we haven't explored yet. In the northwestern corner of the atrium is a door leading to the locker room. We were there. This one leads to the gym. We were there. On the wall is a propaganda poster. In case of nuclear winter, power up. That's a T-51 suit. Not sure how they expect vault dwellers or civilians to get their hands on that. With the bottom floor explored, we can take a staircase up to this mezzanine level. Here we find another corpse lying on the ground, this guy holding a big knife. To the north, we find a bunch of plants growing on that level, but no staircase leading over to it. We can use our jetpack to sail over there, and here we find another body. She had a sniper rifle, but there's nothing else hiding in the plants over here. So leaping back down, we can explore behind this staircase. Here we find a bunch of boxes and another Vault Dweller corpse stuffed into this cart. Moving back to the staircase, we can scale the stairs. We find one door at the top leading to the Overseer. It's locked with an ID card reader. Can we activate it? No, still missing an ID card. Back down to the platform, we can move to the other side. To the north, we find a door leading to Laundry. It's locked with a skill level zero lock. We can pick it. We find smears of blood on the ground, but then lying on one of the laundry machines is another Vault 51 executive keycard. Huh, so multiple iterations of the same keycard. Then we find the source of the blood. Lying on the ground behind the laundry machine is a Vault Dweller stabbed through the heart with a mop. Oh, what a way to go. I mean, that takes a lot of upper body strength to stab someone through the heart with a mop. Yikes. It looks like he was using a giddy-up buttercup leg as a blunt weapon. Oh, jeez. I kind of wish I could have seen this melee. With laundry explored, we can head back out to the atrium. Against the western wall, we find a big double door to residential. It's locked with a skill level one lock, but we can pick it. Oh, data in predictions more accurate. Don't count on it, buddy. 
I don't plan on dying anytime soon. All right, so we're in another residential wing. Lots of doors here. We'll open this one to the north first, and we find a bunch of bunk beds. Lots of dressers and couches, but not much else. Though in this room, we find a door to the west that leads to a bathroom. Moving towards the stalls, we find another vault dweller corpse, but we hear something moving in the showers. With the showers clear, we can examine this corpse. She lies dead on a toilet with a shotgun on the ground, and the stall walls have toppled over. Some great force killed her in this stall. Hate to imagine what that could have been. Must have been some chilly night. From here, we find two doors. One leads back to the common room. The one to the west leads to a hallway that circles around to another bedroom that also leads to the common room. The common room is mostly empty. We killed all the ghouls in here. So heading back to the second bedroom, we find two corpses lying in bed together. Lovers who died in each other's arms. Seems like a peaceful way to go. Perhaps they poisoned themselves, choosing to go out together. The southern doorway leading out of this room brings us to another bathroom. The showers in this one are empty, so we can check the stalls. The first one has a doodle. Some little sheep, maybe? They were playing tic-tac-toe. The other stalls are empty, but the eastern door in this room leads to the third and final bedroom. We find a weapon mod lying on a dresser here and some socks on the ground under one of the bunk beds. But aside from that, this room is empty. And so back to the common room, we can go through the big double doors back out to the atrium. All right, turning south, we've got this door over here. This one is also locked with an ID card reader. But the executive key card we looted opens it. And oh, ho, 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 look at this guy. Someone killed him with a fire axe to the chest through marine combat armor. Oh, well, we found our way to the level overlooking the stage. Oddly enough, there's another executive key card lying on this table here. That's the third one we've found in this vault. And here on a table with a bunch of punch glasses, we find the holotape Joel and Elizabeth Chambers, August 3rd, 2078. This level has a door on the western wall, which leads to a staircase, which brings us down to a door we can open with a button. And this puts us just outside the stage. All right, so this is where that door led. I suppose it's time to start exploring these doors on the bottom level locked with ID card readers. Opening this one first. We go down a hallway and turn right. We arrive in a room filled with cameras. The cameras point through windows overlooking the boxing ring. This must be where they filmed and broadcasted the matches throughout the vault. On a table between the cameras is the holotape Clayton Ward, April 15th, 2078. And lying next to it is the Vault 51 security key card. Hey, brand new key card. I wonder what door this opens. Moving through the northern door, it turns a corner and we can open this door with a button on the wall. Okay. So those three doors explored. Well, I wonder what we can open with the security key card. This vault is mostly explored. We just have a few doors. We've now got to figure out how to open. Heading back to the atrium, we can climb the stairs all the way to the top and explore this southwestern corner, which we haven't been to yet. Here we do find a door locked with an ID card reader. We'll try it in a second. Turning around, we find another dead vault dweller with a sniper rifle lying between this couch and a table. When done exploring, we can try the ID card reader. But we don't have the right card. Oh no, we still have to find another card. Moving to the other side, can we use it on the overseer's door? No. Huh. Well, there was only one other door we couldn't open, and that was on the ground floor of the atrium. Heading back to the ground floor, we can move to the southern wall and try to activate this ID card reader. And it works. All right. The third and final ID card must be somewhere in here. Moving in, we arrive in some sort of utility room. Oh, and there's a body hanging from the ceiling. Oh man. Exploring this bottom floor first, we round a corner to find another key card lying on a console. The Vault 51 Overseer key card. That's it. We can now get into the Overseer room. This control room on the ground is pretty small. It's just one big square. On a console to the northeast, we find another holotape, Sergeant Baker, November 20th, 2077. 
Now, let's see if we can loot this body. A pipe in the ceiling is broken, and he dangles in the crack of the pipe. We see that before this guy was strung up, he was wearing a hat. Directly beneath him are two bottle caps that fell out of his pockets and a prospector's hat. The more data I collect, the clearer the picture becomes of the perfect overseer. Unless, of course, your premise is flawed. Strongest in combat, or wiliest, does not always make the best leader. Surprised you never thought of that, Zax. Jumping up, we can try to loot it, but it's empty. I used my jetpack to get on a platform above to get a better view. How did they even get him up there? Well, we can walk around this platform to see if we find anything. There's a lot of machinery over here. Behind one is an ammo box and a hunting rifle, but that's about it. But then, peering up, we see a catwalk above the pipes. There's no staircase leading up there. And so before moving to the overseer door, I wanted to explore it. Oh no! a nasty surprise. All right, uh, turning around, we see a door and windows to a bedroom. Oh, it's the overseer's office. <laughs> we managed to skip the door. We have to bear in mind that this vault was designed for a situation where players wouldn't have jetpacks while exploring it. But then again, we did need the security key card to even get to this room where we found the overseer key card. So it's not like we're really skipping a step here. All right, well, if that leads to the overseer's office, uh, what's on the other side of this catwalk? Moving that way, we find a large platform flanked by pipes and lying on the ground is another holotape, Sergeant Baker, August 6th, 2078. Welcome, candidate. Please, refrain from soiling anything. Soiling anything? Bit too late for that, buddy. Kind of made a mess over there. In the middle of this southern wall is a room bathed in red light. Heading inside, we can open a door to find Zax. There he is. Uh, well, we missed the overseer's office. We'll come back, Zax. Kill you later. Turning around, we can open the door to the overseer's office. And sure enough, we made it. Lying on a coffee table is, well, presumably the overseer, or one of the many overseers. She lies with a bowie knife stabbed in the middle of her back. <laughs> and let's see, I wanted to figure out which of these staircases led to the door. Moving through the western door, we go down a staircase. Yep, we push a button, and we arrive on the right side of the atrium which must mean that if we go back down to the atrium platform and head up the staircase, we can use the key card on this door. Bingo, then up. We turn right to open another door to again arrive at the overseer's office. On a bar, we find the next holotape, Sergeant Baker, October 13th, 2077. Then moving to the overseer's desk, we find a robot iBot model lying right next to the window, but the overseer's desk is empty. Though here we do find a plaque. Let's see if we can read it. Excellence in bravery in recognition of the canned mystery meat experiment. You volunteered to eat when no one else would. We are so proud of you and glad you are not dead. Nice. The last overseer was so proud of this feat that she put it on her desk next to her terminal. But there isn't much else here by the overseer's desk. So moving on, we can open a door to the south. It's locked with a skill level one lock. Inside, we find the overseer's bedroom. There is a sentry bot model robot right next to the terminal. Next to the TV on the table is Reuben Gill, March 3rd, 2094. And then on the desk is the next terminal. Here we find the Aiden Higgins, February 21st, 2078 entry. In the bathroom, we find a golf club on the ground and a huge spatter of blood in the shower. Well, either someone cut herself while shaving or someone got attacked with a golf club. But we don't find a body. There's a first aid kit on a hamper. And then moving back to the bedroom, we find a little laundry nook to the west. 
There is a bulletin board above the laundry machines, but these notes are all illegible. There is a cabinet on the wall with a couple of notes. Need more sugar bombs. Reminder, don't put TP on backwards. Heading out of the bedroom, we can finish the overseer's office by climbing the staircase to explore the loft. Here we find a wood-burning fireplace, a shelf with decorations, and a table by a computer where the overseer would have powwows with Zax. But that's it for the overseer's office, and that's it for most of the vault. We have but one thing left to do, and that's to go through the southern door, cross the catwalks into the room, bathed in red light, and climb the stairs to confront Zax. But before we can get close to Zax... Oh no, what is that? There are three scorched in that room, one of whom is wearing a full suit of Hellfire Power Armor. That's the power armor that this vault requisitioned from Stanislaus Braun. But if he's wearing it, it means we won't be able to find it. Oh, we have to destroy it to kill him. Now, for some reason, these scorched didn't like wandering down the stairs. And so, well, I'm not ashamed to admit that I sort of kind of, you know, cheesed it a bit. I hung back here and let him shoot his Gatling laser into the wind. And between bursts, I ducked around the corner to get off a few shots. Testing in Vault 51 will continue as normal. Progress was really slow. This Gauss rifle really depends upon sneak criticals. I got him to about half life and then for some reason he lost interest in me. After hiding for enough time, he turned around and walked back towards Zax. This allowed me to get a few sneak criticals off. then turn around, shoot some more, then go back to Zax, and I could land more sneak criticals. In this way, I slowly, but eventually, finished them off. And with that, he's dead. Heading up the stairs, we can try to find his body. He died on the platform right next to Zax. Take solace that you will live forever as data used in my prediction algorithm. Yes, well, for some reason, that's not giving me a lot of comfort, Zax. On the body, we find a super stim pack. Pretty cool. But sadly, as I thought, the Hellfire power armor is now ruined. We can't loot it. Bomber! Well, we can at least explore Zax's room here. After looting the dead, we see pipes and terminals lining the walls and ceilings, and there are three terminals here we can interact with. The first is the Overseer's Terminal, and it has all of the same entries that we found on it before. Nothing new. Exploring to the sides of the platform, we don't find much, just one tool case with random scrap inside and an End of Dungeon steamer trunk. Moving up to Zax, we can't talk to him. We can't activate him. We can't destroy him. Well, but maybe we can using the terminal. There are two Zax terminals on either side of Zax. In the first, we see Zax going through a bunch of overseer selection attempts and practicing his emotional response experiments. All the same entries we read before. And moving to the other terminal, we find his report on Appalachia and his detection of human life forms outside of Vault 51. This is what caused him to open the door to Vault 51 and to turn on acting overseer Reuben Gill. But there's sadly nothing else new here. A new boss, but no new lore. And apparently, no way to kill Zax. But at least we killed the overseer. My data did not show this outcome as a possibility. I must make adjustments. Are you sad, Zax, that I killed your overseer? Yeah, I tried firing a few shots off on him, but we can't do anything to kill the stinking computer. Well, with that, we'll leave Zax to conduct even further experiments. We found all holotapes and all terminal entries. None of the holotapes have been cut, 
They're all exactly where they were during nuclear winter, and only one terminal was cut. There used to be a terminal in the atrium called the Nuclear Winter Information Terminal. It had entries on the overseer selection process, perks we could get during nuclear winter. It was basically a tutorial for how the nuclear winter game mode worked. So it makes sense why they cut it now that there is no nuclear winter game mode. Aside from that, all of the rest of the lore is here. So the story we told in my last video is still canonical. The entire drama that happened after the bombs dropped, culminating in Reuben Gill becoming the overseer until he was deposed by Zax, whereupon he found his way out of Vault 51 using a supply cache, happened. Now we need to piece together what happened after Reuben Gill left the vault and Zax opened the door to Vault 51. We know that Zax had already done reconnaissance of post-war Appalachia and was beginning to think that Wastelanders might be better candidates for Overseer than the residents of Vault 51. In his Anomalous Life Forms Detected entry, Zax posited that supermutants, or mutated humans as he called them, might be good candidates to become an Overseer. But he also talked about the scorched, or the burned humans, saying that their unwillingness to sabotage members of their own social group, that is, their unwillingness to attack other scorched, would disqualify them as good candidates for Overseer, which makes it all the more confusing as to why when we arrive here in Vault 51, it's a scorched who's wearing the Hellfire power armor and is acting Overseer. And then there are all of the bodies we found in Vault 51. How do we explain them? Well, I don't think any of those bodies can be the remains of the original vault dwellers. After all, their bodies were disposed of in incinerators as they died. Really, the only body of the original vault dweller we find is that of Reuben Gill out in the wasteland. The sole exception might be the skeletal remains we found under the bookcase. Those had been around long enough to have decayed substantially compared to all of the other corpses in the vault. Perhaps that's the remains of one of the original vault dwellers. But all of the rest are new. I think what happened is after Reuben Gill escaped, Zax opened the doors, hoping to get more humans or even super mutants into the vault so he could again conduct his experiment. And that's exactly what happened. People stumbled into the vault, but I don't think it was one big raider gang. I think it was a hodgepodge of wastelanders, explorers, some raiders, some prospectors, opportunists trying to loot the vault. I don't think the big battle outside the vault that we partook in during the events of Nuclear Winter ever actually happened. After all, that wouldn't have made sense for Zax's experiment. He's conducting an experiment trying to find the best overseer for the vault. Why then would he send everyone out into the wasteland to fight each other when what he really wanted was someone to stay in the vault to run it, someone he could observe from within the vault. I think everything that happened outside the vault during the event of Nuclear Winter was for our benefit. It was so that Bethesda could have a new game mode that didn't just take place in one big vault. But I think according to the evidence we find here, none of that actually happened. What happened is people made their way into the vault and started to loot all of those containers where they found marine combat armor, weapons. But Zax, the computer constantly talking at them, scared some of them, intimidated some of them. Maybe some of them escaped. Maybe others tried to turn Vault 51 into a home. But we know that we wouldn't have found the bodies that we find there in the way that we found them if they had been able to leave the vault. Especially since we find the remains of people who appeared to be non-combatants. Remember, we found that couple lying in bed who chose to just die in each other's arms rather than fight each other. I think the key here are the two corpses we found in the truck just outside. These guys wanted to get away with some of their loot. They didn't want anyone else inside the vault coming after them, perhaps trying to kill them as part of the overseer's experiment. Or perhaps they were being humanitarians and they didn't want anyone else to stumble inside the vault to be forced to take part in this experiment by Zax. And so they rigged up a mechanism that closed the vault door. And as we find from the inside, once you're in the vault, there's no way to open the door unless Zax opens it. There's no switch or button that we can use to toggle the door open or closed. 
That's why the guys had to hack together a button outside. Another possibility is that maybe Zax closed the door after the vault was full, and these guys were trying to hack the door open so they could rescue some people inside. Maybe they were part of a small raider gang and had come here to rescue their boss. Now, how they died in the back of the truck, I suppose is anyone's guess. Maybe after rigging the button and closing the door, they turned on each other and killed each other, or perhaps they were waylaid by monsters. At any rate, now Zax has a vault filled with people. But what he didn't know is that some of those people brought with them the Scorched Plague. This must have taken place before the events of Wastelanders, or during the period of time between the primary plot of Fallout 76 and the beginning of Wastelanders, while people were coming back to Appalachia in droves. Before the Vault 76 Overseer, with our help, created a cure for the plague, and before that cure was widely distributed to the people of Appalachia. So all these people locked in this vault begin to attack each other as part of Zax's plan, killing each other in the most gruesome ways possible, wearing some of the gear they found in the vault, but also wearing some of the gear they brought with them, carrying bottle caps, for example, which probably wouldn't have been found outside of a Nuka-Cola machine before the war, wearing clothing that wasn't regulation vault gear or military gear, like the wooden armor we found on some corpses, or even the prospector hat we found beneath the dangling body. One by one, these people died, while others slowly began to succumb to the Scorched Plague. We know from his terminal entry that Zax didn't really want to put a Scorched in charge. But somebody became an overseer while he was still human. He got into the Hellfire power armor and then became Scorched. The rest of the Scorched wouldn't attack him because Scorched don't attack Scorched, and so Zax's experiment was failing. With the Scorched unwilling to attack each other, Zax couldn't get any more results. But then we arrive, and we take out the remaining Scorched, and we kill the Overseer in the Hellfire Power Armor. But because the door is still open, and there's no one outside to close it behind us, we can turn around and walk away, and Zax can't keep us here. One wonders why Zax wouldn't just remotely close the door. Well, maybe when the guys outside in the truck rigged the door, they somehow severed Zax's connection to the door so that Zax is no longer in control of it. Or maybe he doesn't close the door behind us because we're only one person, or a small handful of people, not a vault full of people. And he's waiting for a full vault before he closes his door. Who knows? Perhaps this is the unforeseen event that he was grumbling about while we were exploring his room. Perhaps that's why he was so frustrated when he talked about needing to make adjustments to his experiment. And with no way to turn Zax off, I suppose this story will repeat itself over and over again. And with that, we fully explore Vault 51 a second time. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the story of Vault 51 and the overall Vault 51 experiment and experience. Did you like the Battle Royale Nuclear Winter mode when it was available? Were you sad when it disappeared? And are you glad that despite scrapping Nuclear Winter, Bethesda put Vault 51 back into the game as a canonical vault? Are you pleased with the way that they did so? Did you wish you could get a suit of Hellfire power armor, like I did? Or would that have been too big of a prize for the kind of vault that we just explored? Let me know your thoughts in the comment sections below. I publish new Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon, 
or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members and patrons on Patreon gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, and YouTube members get little badges that appear next to their names in the comment sections of my videos, and access to aux emojis that they can use in my video comments and in the live chats of my live streams. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.